Uh, so, hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, debugging Nomad uh, applications in production and about APMs. So, but first a few things about me. Uh, I was a consultant for over a decade, worked at uh, Sun, founded a couple of companies, wrote a couple of books, wrote a lot of open source code, and currently work as a developer advocate for Lightrun. My email and Twitter accounts are listed here, so feel free to write uh, to me if you have a question, you don't get a chance to chat to me about it. And also follow uh, my blog, talktotheduck.dev, which uh, isn't about ducks, but mostly about debugging and stuff. Uh, so I want to start about talking about APMs. Uh, I love APMs. They're wonderful. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the time when they weren't around, and I'm so happy that we moved past that. The, these dashboards are absolutely amazing. Uh, you get this great dashboard with everything you need, and we're truly in a golden age of monitoring. Uh, when I started programming, uh, monitoring was just walking up to a server and kicking it to listen to see uh, if you can hear the hard drive uh, making a noise. And this is such a huge improvement. So today with Nomad, deployments are scaled to a level where tools like this are essential. You literally can't deploy without some sort of monitoring in place when you're doing stuff at that scale. Without an APM, well, I'd like to say we're blind as a bat, which, well, obviously bats aren't really blind. That's a myth, but uh, it's a sort of a point time recurring through this presentation. So a lot of the issues we run into are as a result uh, of anomalies we see inside the dashboard. We see spikes or failures or something that performs a bit too slow, and the APM is really, really amazing in showing those sort of hiccups. But, but this is sort of where it stops. Uh, it can tell us uh, that a web service performed badly or failed. It can tell us why. It can point at a line of code. So let's stop for a second and talk about a different line, this one. On the one side, we have developers, and on the other side, we have the ops or DevOps. This is the line that we've had for a long time. It's something we drew out of necessity because when developers were given access to production, well, I don't want to be too dramatic, but when developers got access to production, it didn't end well. This was literally the situation not too long ago. We had sysadmins, but the whole process used to be a mess. That was no good. We need a better solution uh, than this hard separation because the ops guys don't necessarily know how to solve the problem made by the developers. They know how to solve ops problems. So when a no band agent has a problem and the DevOps don't know how to fix it, well, it starts a problematic feedback loop of test, redeploy, rinse, repeat. That isn't ideal. So monitoring tools are kind of like the bat signal. Uh, remember, I said, I'll get back to this. They come up, and we, the developers, we're Batman or Batwoman or Batperson. Everyone's welcome. Uh, damn heroes, that's what's important. And we step up to deal with the uh, bugs and uh, last line against their villainy, so to speak. Well... Code or bad people, really. Kind of the same thing, just without the six-pack abs, you know, the kitchen here, all the sweets. You get my drift. So Code or bad man needs to know where the crime or bugs are actually happening in the code. So these dashboards, they point us towards the crime existing in the general direction, but it doesn't really tell us where the problem is. And this is where things get hard we start digging into the logs and trying to find the problem. The dashboard sent us in a general vague direction, like a performance problem or higher rates and stuff like that. But we need to jump into the logs and hope that maybe we can find something there that will somehow explain the problem that we're seeing. That's like going from a jet engine back to Stone Age tools. There are many log processing platforms that do an amazing job at processing these logs and finding the goal within them. But 
even then it's it's a needle in a haystack that's the good outcome where a log is already there waiting for us with an answer but obviously we can't have logging all over the place our billing will go through the roof and our performance will well it will suffer putting it mildly we're stuck in the sloop of add a new log go through ci cd which includes the qa cycle and everything this can take hours then we produce the issue in the production servers with your fingers crossed and try to analyze what went wrong. Hopefully you found the issue because if not, it's effectively rinse, repeat for the whole process. In the meantime, you still have a bug in production and developers are wasting their time. There has to be a better way. It's 2021 and logs are the way we solve the bugs in this day and age. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love logs. Today's logs are totally different from what we had even 10 years ago. But you need to know about your problem in advance for a log to work. And I'm not clairvoyant. When I write code, I can't tell what bugs or problems the code will have before the code is written. I'm in the same boat as you. The bug doesn't exist yet. So I'm faced with the dilemma of whether to log something. And this is a bit like the dilemma of writing comments. Does it make sense, look noisy or stupid, or will I find this useful at 2 a.m. when everything isn't working and I want to rip out the few strands of hair I have, still have here? So it's a production problem. Uh, so debuggers, they're wonderful. I love debuggers. Uh, they let us set breakpoints, see call stacks, inspect variables, and so much more. If only we could do the same for production systems. But debuggers weren't designed for this. They're very insecure when debugging remotely. They can block your server while sending debug uh, commands remotely. A small mistake, such as an expensive condition, can literally destroy a nomad agent on, in an instant. Uh, I might be repeating an urban legend here, but 20 years or so ago, I heard a story about a guy who was debugging a railed system located on a cliff he stopped at a breakpoint during debugging, and the multi-million dollar hardware fell into the sea because it didn't receive the stop command. Again, I don't know if it's a true story, but it's plausible. And that's really, we believe it can happen, and stuff like that does happen if you try to debug uh, things that matter. Debuggers weren't really designed for situations like production debugging. And worse, debuggers are limited to one server. If you have essentially a nomad cluster, uh, many agents with multiple machines and a complex deployment, a problem can manifest on one agent. It might manifest on all of them. It, it can be anywhere. And you're really relying on luck of the draw when you're looking at the deployment. Uh, so, if we have multiple servers, multiple agents with multiple languages, platforms crossing from one to another with a debugger, well, it's possible in theory, but I can't even imagine it in reality. Definitely not in the scales that we see our deployments. So let's take the Batman metaphor all the way. We need a sort of team up. We need uh, some help on the servers, especially in a clustered polyglot environment where the issue can appear on one nomad agent, move on to the next, etc. So you remember this slide. We need some way to get through that line, not to remove it. We, we like that line. It's a good line. We need a way to connect with the nomad agent and debug it. Now, I'm a developer, so I try to stay away from management buzzwords and that stuff. Uh, uh, but the word for this is shift left. It essentially means we're letting developers and QA get back some of the access we used to have into the ops without demolishing the gains we had in security and stability. We love the ops people and we need them. So this is about helping them keep everything running smoothly in Nomad without stepping on their toes or blowing up their deployment and you know getting everything to work nicely. So. This leads us here. What if you could connect your server to a debugger agent that would make sure you don't overload the server and don't make a mistake like setting a breakpoint or something like that that's uh, 
that's really what Lycan does. Now, I'd like to take a short moment to mention uh, the term agent. A nomad agent is used to describe the process running. It's the same for Lightrun. So when I say agent, I will qualify it with Lightrun or Nomad for clarity because uh, it might be slightly confusing. So how does this thing work? Well, we install the Lightrun plugin in our ID and let it interact with uh, the Lightrun server. We can insert an action which can be a log or a snapshot or a measurement metric. I'll show all of these soon enough. This talk will go into the code portion soon. Notice that the Lightrun server can be installed in the cloud or as a SaaS or on-premise and managed by uh, ops. The management server sends everything to the Lightrun agent, which is installed on a Nomad agent. That means there is a clear separation between the developer and the production. The DevOps still has that uh, guarding line we're talking about and we don't have uh, direct access to production. That means no danger to the running production servers from a careless developer, well, kind of like myself, sorry. Uh, the Lightrun agent is just a small runtime you add to your Nomad agent. It's very low overhead and it implements the debugging logic. Finally, everything is piped through the server back to your ID, to the developer ID directly. So as a developer, you can keep working in the IDE without leaving your comfort zone. So I'll demonstrate a to-do app. I want a better demo, but trying to run and explain a true polyglot uh, microservice environment in a conference session will probably confuse all of us more than it will teach. And frankly, with the amount of time, I'm happy I picked a simple demo. Uh, myself included, I'd also be confused. So this is all good. The front-end code connects to a Node.js server. This is actually pretty, a pretty sensible architecture. It lets the front-end guys handle all their stuff, including the start of the back-end area. And Node.js scales reasonably well and can handle stuff it's good at, uh, communicating with the UI front-end, etc. Storage transactions and reliability are decades ahead in the world of Java. So using Spring Boot for the back-end uh, heavy lifting also makes sense. Uh, a merge of the best each world has to offer. It also lets us hire the right people for the right job. So we start by signing up on Lightrun.com, then we can set up the agent ID plugin, which lets us debug this application. Uh, next, we need to connect uh, the Lightrun agent into individual nomad agents. Now, this is where it gets interesting. For the Java code, we can use uh, the Lightrun driver for nomad. This is explained in the docs, so I'll just Touch it briefly in general. The Lightrun Java driver accepts all configuration options of the Nomad Java, Nomad Java driver. So to get the driver working, we need to download the Lightrun driver repository, find the Lightrun Java driver in the repository root folder, copy the driver to your Nomad plugins directory. Then when running the Nomad agent, we need to specify the path the plugin, uh, to the plugin directory. The Lightroom Java driver accepts all configuration options uh, of the Nomad Java driver. We just need to add Lightroom Java as, the dri as a driver to our job file. Then we need to set the secret that we got from the Lightroom administration server. That does it for the Java driver. Uh, we don't yet have integration for Node and Python. But the integrations there, there are simpler since they can be done in the code level. And you don't need a driver like you do in the Java portion. So you can just follow the instructions on the Lightroom website and will work with Nomad pretty seamlessly. So it's really easier in some regards. So now that this is working, let's go to the simple to-do app used by so many demos in the past. Now, the funny thing is that I was going to demonstrate something completely different and ran into this bug accidentally as I was working on the code. Well, opportunity knocks. I can't clear completed to-do items in the app. Well, it's time to pull out uh, the debuggers and figure out what's going on. The only problem is that these are two servers running on remote containers in production. I can't just debug them. So let's look at the code and see if I can spot some problem. Now, 
this is the method that implements uh, the clear completed in the node server. I assume we all know how to debug the client, so I didn't really show that part. But even if we don't, the technique would instantly show if the problem is in the client. You'll notice that we don't have any logging here. That would have been really nice, but obviously we can't put logs everywhere. Besides the huge cost of logs at scale, this also costs in performance on the individual machine. So I'm not a huge fan of overlogging. So I already installed Lightrun on both servers here. I won't go into the install process since it's trivial and we don't have much time. I also have uh, Lightrun installed in my IDE, so I, I can just add a snapshot to the method to see if it's even reached. A snapshot is like a breakpoint. It gives us the stack trace and the variable values, but it doesn't stop the debugger in place. So a production uh, server won't block on a snapshot. The camera icon we see on the left is the line on which we set up the snapshot. But we also want to see the end of the method was reached. Did we return from the method if only there was a log? Well, we can inject new logs in runtime. We can just add a new log and type in the details we want in that log. And bam, we can see the log right here. The cool thing is that if you have built-in logs, the log will be integrated with the rest of the logs, so you can see it in context. In this case, I selected that the log will pipe into the IDE console, uh, which is more convenient for demos and quick tests. But when you do this, in real life, viewing the log as if it was written in the code is a game changer that can literally save you millions. And in my opinion, logging is debugging. So the ability to inject logs is literally debugging, uh, enhanced. Now, let's go back into the browser and press that dysfunctional button. Then go back into the ID and wait a couple of seconds for the whole loopback of events to reach us. Now we can see the snapshot was hit. That means the calls reached that method, which already eliminates a lot of potential problems. Now we can look in the stack trace on the left to see who invoked that method, or look within the variables on the right to see if there is an interesting variable we missed. We should also check out the log console where we can see that the method reached the log line. So we didn't get an exception or some other problem. Hmm, this is odd. Let's check the Spring Boot server. So this is the Spring Boot server code. Notice this is Java code representing a REST request for a, the clear completed API. It deletes all the elements that are marked completed, then returns the to-do items that remain. So I want to add a log here, just like I did in the Node.js code. But in this case, I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to add an expression to the log. I'm going to print out the number of items in the response variable, which is a type of a list, that means I'll literally invoke the size method on that object within the curly braces here. Now, you might be thinking, why not print the whole thing? Why not print the response object? Well, it won't work well. There are two reasons. First, it might output too much text and get corrupted, uh, cropped, sorry. But the more important aspect is evaluation speed. When we're running in a production environment, changes can be very dangerous. If we evaluate these expressions dynamically, it might take too much CPU and crash our server. So Lightrun limits the amount of operations you can do in an expression. If I'll print that list, Lightrun might just eliminate my log because of CPU usage. So the code here needs to be very efficient. So let's press OK and go to the browser to trigger the event. I'll press clear completed again, and then we'll go back to the server. So back in the server, we can see the log showing, and that's weird. The API is showing that we're returning two elements. That doesn't make sense. But this is the core idea of debugging. Validate your assumptions. I don't get that. I want to check the values. So for that, I'll need to edit the log entry and instead of listing the size of the list, I want to print out the content of the first element in the list using the get zero method call. 
Pressing OK deletes the current log and creates a new log object in its place. We now need to go back to the web and clear the completed elements again. And after a short wait, the log prints out the result. It seems that this is the bug. Looking at the values for the object, it's obvious that the completed field is false on the server. That's why it wasn't cleared. With that in hand, I looked at the code that toggles the completed field on the Node.js server, and uh, oops, it seems that code was never written. The completed field was only set on initialization, so that's the bug. That's very cool, but that's just one type of production problem. For a different production problem, let's go back to the slides and look at one of my first slides. So this is a dashboard I found off Google. It isn't mine, but you probably see a couple of interesting things here. I mean, what's this? What the hell happened here? If you use a dashboard, you probably see stuff like that all the time. And ask yourself the exact same question. How Now, APMs are pretty sweet. They will usually tell you which entry point caused a performance issue, which CPU worked too hard, where memory was used up, and all that those sort of things. But what they don't tell you is which block of code took too long. Let's say we have an entry point that takes too long to perform. Now what? We need to review uh, deep calls all over the place to try and pinpoint a specific operation. This might be something we can't reproduce locally. Let's go back to the ID briefly and go over the options here. In this, in the metrics menu, we can add measurements that give us fine-grained benchmarks on the code level. We can count the number of times a line of code was hit. We can measure the duration of a block of code or a method. We can even add more complex metrics based on custom evaluation. The result of the metric can be uh, periodically logged or piped into uh, Prometheus, StatsD, et cetera. This provides that missing piece that we need to see beyond what the APM provides us. That way, we won't spend ages optimizing the wrong area because the production information didn't include all of the lower level information. Please notice that at this moment, measurements are only available for JVM languages, but they will be coming to Node.js and Python in an update that's coming really, really soon. So in closing, I'd like to go over what we discussed here and a few things we didn't have time for. Lightrun supports JVM languages like Java, Kotlin, Scala, et cetera. It supports Node for both JavaScript and TypeScript code and Python, even complex stuff like Airflow, which is really, really cool if you need you know, those sort of things like Kafka and stuff like that. Really cool. Uh, when we add actions, conditions uh, run within Sandbox so they don't take up a CPU or crash the system. This all happens without uh, networking, so something like a networking hiccup won't uh, crash the server. Security is especially crucial with solutions uh, like this. One of the core concepts is that the server queries information, not the other way around as you would see with solutions such as JDWP, et cetera. This means operations are atomic and the server can be hidden behind firewalls even from the rest of the organization. PII reduction lets us define conditions that would obscure patterns in the logs. So if a user could print out a credit card number by mistake, you can define a rule that would block that. This way, the bad data won't make it into your logs and won't expose you to liability. Blacklisting lets us uh, block uh, blocklisting. Sorry, lets us block specific classes, methods, or files. This means you can block developers in your organization from debugging specific files. This means developer uh, a developer won't be able to put a snapshot or a log in a place where a password might be available to steal user credentials or stuff like that. This is hugely important in large organizations. Besides the sandbox, I'd like to also mention that Lightroom is very efficient and our benchmarks has almost no runtime impact. When it isn't used, it has very, a very small impact, even with multiple actions in place. And finally, Lightroom can be used from the cloud or using an on-premise install. It works with any deployment you might have, whether cloud-based, container-based, on-premise, microservices, serverless, etc. 
So thanks for bearing with me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please feel free to ask questions in uh, the YouTube chat and uh, check me out at talktoduck.dev and lightron.com and everything. And thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. And you did get us closer to time, so we really appreciate that. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. I talked very fast. <laughs> Most thank much you. appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, um, Shai. Have a great day.